Okay, so now we're on question three and four. Question three and four. So the first question is define the term specific heat capacity. So the specific heat capacity of a body is the heat needed to change the body by unit temperature. And the second one is define the term specific latent heat of vaporization. And so the specific latent heat of vaporization of a substance is the heat needed to change unit mass of the substance from a liquid to gas without a change of temperature. So remember that latent means hidden. And also these two questions came on last year's test. Now a substance which has a freezing point of 80 degrees Celsius was cooled from 90 degrees Celsius to a total solid at its freezing point. Sketch a graph on figure 4 to represent the statement above. So it's just going from 90, come down, plateau, come down again. And at this area, the solid to liquid state existing. No heat is lost. This is where the latent heat exists. Then you have here a student conducted an experiment in which 1.5 kilograms of water at 30 degrees Celsius was converted to steam at 100. And the question was really step by step. It helped you out. It didn't just ask what was the total heat loss. They, did, they, they broke it down into stages for you. So assuming no heat is lost, the surroundings calculate the amount of energy needed to heat the water from 30 to 100. So going from 30 to 100, you realize there's a temperature change. So once there's a temperature change, you use this equation, which is MCAT. And you say EH equal to what's the mass? 1.5 kilograms times what they give you down here. They give you the specific heat capacity of water, which is C, 4200 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. If you put Celsius, and note that they made a mistake. For the first time I ever see a mistake on um, a past paper. This K is supposed to be K. This is supposed to be KG minus 1. So maybe they would have to check into that. And so once it is now, the temperature change is actually 100 minus 30 degrees Celsius. You don't convert this to um, Kelvin. You don't need to because they are equal at equal increments on this scale when you compare them. A Celsius and a Kelvin are equal increments, so you don't have to convert it. You only convert it when you're doing the gas laws, PV, um, when you're doing V over T, because V over T, which is Charles law, so you would only do it like that. So here we have 1.5 times 4200 times 70, and we got 141,000. So, sorry, 441,000. Joules. So we got that. Now it says convert the water at 100 degrees Celsius to steam. So I'm going to draw the water, and this is 100 degrees Celsius water, and now it's changing phase 100 degrees Celsius here. And so is there a change in temperature? No, just phase change. So we're going to use EH equal to ML. V because it's vaporization going on here and again we have the numbers down here it's 2.3 times 76 joules per kilogram so you know the mass is 1.5 kg and latent heat of vaporization of water is 2.3 times 76 joules per kilogram so those units will cancel out And it's uh, 1.5 times 2.3 times 10 to the 6, 3,450,000 joules. This is the heat, the water from 32 steam at 100 degrees Celsius so you just add in it to know they want the total heat
this will be e total and this will be equal to three million eight hundred and ninety one thousand joules and we could just write it like this three eight nine one kilojoules Right, so right that. So don't forget they made a mistake here. So I hope you picked it up in the examination. Now we're moving on to section B, question four. It says, state three features of an image produced in a mirror plane. First of all, you know the image size will be the same. So same size of image of object no image will be the same size as the object so let me see image would be same size of object to the image the, the image would be laterally inverted uh, non super impo imposable on the object and three the image is virtual it's not real okay so that now explain why the word uh, police is painted in this manner at the front of some emergency vehicles so I wrote this to try to make some sense. I said, if it were written as police, then it would appear backwards or laterally inverted in a rear view mirror, which would or may make it hard to decipher by a driver. Hence, writing police as this would make warning individuals easier and more rational to achieve quicker reaction time by drivers. So I wrote that, that makes sense to me, and I hope you wrote something that makes sense to you. Now that they dropped, they dropped in the drawing of the red diagram, and it's not too bad. So remember, wherever it starts here, if you have an image here, this is completed. So basically, if you have an image, if it starts here, then there is an object, sorry, right here. So the height of the object. Now you know you have this line passes directly through the optic So this is gonna pass. This one gonna pass directly through the optic center. Yes. I'm trying to find common ground here. And then this one is gonna conjoin. Conjoin here. Focal no. It's gonna pass through the focal line. Mm -hmm. It's gonna pass through the focal line. And conjoin somewhere over here. Which, good. So those are the two marks you will get. So therefore, the image would form where the lines conjoin, which is somewhere here. This image, the image is upside down. It's inverted. This is complete. The red diagram to show the path of the ray 
of the emerging ray after it passes through the lens. And so this will pretty much be it. So you have the you have the line that passes directly through the optical center, which is here, and then the top ray would be would pass along straight, then it would refract, passing directly through the center of the focal length. So it says complete it says, uh, on the diagram label the focal length. So the focal length is the distance between the optical center and focal plane. So here we have it. Focal length. Alright, so that's F. And it says an object A B was placed 15 centimeters in front of a converging lens of focal length 5 centimeters. Calculate the image distance. So we use lens equation 1 over F equal 1 over U plus 1 over V. And we know the focal length is 5 centimeters. And either which you could de denote the U or V wherever because they're both positive. So we're going to say 1 over 15. And we're looking for the image distance equal to let me say plus 1 over v so what's going to happen you're going to have 1 over 5 centimeters minus 1 over 15 centimeters equal to 1 over v 1 over v would eventually equal to you could just do it right here 1 divided by 5 minus 1 divided by 15. You have 0 0.1333. Right? And so now you're going to have to transpose again. You're going to move the V up. So you can say 1 over 0 0.1333 equal to V. So V will be equal to 1 divided by put this whole thing over it. And I get 7.5. So V is equal to 7.5 centimeters. So the image distance is 7.5 centimeters. Now the magnification, uh, the magnification of the image would be mag would be equal to the image distance. It could be the, the distance of the image over the distance of the object or the height of the image over the height of the object. So you would say the image distance over the object's distance. And the image distance is, we calculated just now, 7.5 centimeters. Well, the object's distance was 15. This cancel out, and you know that magnification is a dimensionless quantity, so it wouldn't have any units. So the answer would be 0 0.5. Divided by 15, 0 0.5. Wait, so the image was drawn smaller than the object. And that should have given you your 15 points. Now moving on to question 5. Is there anything on it? Okay, so question 5 says... A semiconductor diode is used in a half-wave rectification. Use the axes in figure 6 to sketch the IV graph for the semiconductor diode. So the semiconductor diode is a non-ohmic conductor. So it produces, it doesn't produce a straight line. It's weird. It, 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 it's like that, that, and then that. So it's like a chair. I drew it nice on my other paper. So it's like a chair, you see? Something like this. It's really nice. So that's how we should look. And then it says complete the truth. So they're testing you. Do you know your truth table? So complete truth table. Once you know what the end table is, it will be the opposite. And I get, I put out a video on how to do logic gates smartly. So the AND gate is the multiplier gate, so if I were to multiply 0 by 0, you should get 0 with the AND gate. But since there's a converter on that AND gate, you're going to have to convert to 1. The converter is a NOT gate. Then if you say well, 0 times 1, you should get 0. So again, put the opposite. 
1 times 0, you get 0, so you put the opposite again. 1 times 1, you should get 1, but since the converter, which is not gated there, you're going to get 0, so that should be. And you're getting a mark for each of them, eh? Four marks. Okay. That would have got me an answer. 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Now, figure 7 shows three resistors in series of values 2 ohms, 5, and 10 ohms. Calculate the equivalent resistance to the resistor. Since they're in series, you say RS. You just add them. You add them, and so you get 2 plus 5 plus 10 equal to 17. 17 ohms. Then the next question deals with the parallel, with them in parallel. The same resistors are placed in parallel. And what we see here is that we could use 1 over RP equals to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R3. And so we're going to just put it in accordingly. 1 over 2 plus 1 over 5. 1 over 10 and this will give us 1 over RP equal to 0 0.5 ohms plus 0 0.2 ohms plus now these are ohms ohms ohm 0 0.1 ohm and 1 over RP again will be equal to 5 6 7 8 0 0.8 ohms but you must know that you're going to transpose that up and this comes down so equal to 1 over 0 0.8 and ohms and you get 1.25 ohms okay the resistors in eight are connected in a circuit to a six volt power supply calculate the total current flowing through the circuit so we know v equals to i r i being current so i is therefore equal to v over r and since V is 6 volts and the resistance is 1.25 ohms, we just use our nifty calculator and we say 6 divided by 1.25, I'll give 4.8. 4.8 amps. I hope you see it. In question six, what's that? Was question five? Oh wow! So we're on question six. So we're just wrapping up. It says lithium seven is an isotope of lithium. The mass number is seven, and the atomic number is three. Use the information above to de determine the number of protons and neutrons present in an atom of lithium seven. So you know that. The atomic number is 3, so that means it has 3 protons. And the neutrons would be um, 7 minus 3, 7 minus 3 equal to 4, and that makes up the mass number. And it says draw a clearly labeled diagram of the structure of lithium 7. So it's just 3 electrons. It's 3 electrons. So you're going to say lithium 3p 4n. First one holds in two electrons, and the next shell can hold up to eight, but only one is necessary because they have three electrons. Okay, so that's how it should look. And then we have in four days, the activity of a sample of lithium decreases to one sixteenth of its original activity, determine the term half life. And I have one, I have a thing right here, it says it is the amount of time a radioactive substance takes to break down by half of its original amount 
So that one, it is the amount of time a radioactive substance takes to break down by half of, the origin, of its original amount. And that makes pretty good sense to me. It says calculate the half-life of lithium. So it says it decreases to one sixteenth of its original activity. And you say, you just find how many half-lives are there. So you know, two times two is four, four times two is eight, eight times two is one sixteenth. So <coughs> you find out that one, two, three, four, you have four half-lives. As in, the, the sample broke down four times, and for it to break down four times every, it, it broke down four times, so that means four times four. So every four days, it broke down. So it broke down here, here is four days. Another half life is another four days. Another half life is another four days. Another half life is another four days, because it took each time um, four days to break down to half of it, what it was. So if it started with 100 grams, it went on to 50 grams, and it went on to 25 grams. So it went on to half each time. And this one is what? Half of 25 is what? 12.5? 12.5? Okay, so you could simply do this, or you could say four times four days will give you 16 days. So 16 days. Okay. So calculate the energy given off in a nuclear reaction if the change in mass is 0 0.201 for you. So it tells us how to convert it. So if 1 U is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, then 0 0.201 for you will be equal to x. So you multiply these two. 0 0.201 for you times 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms divided by 1 u equal to x. Just stick that in the calculator. 0 0.2014 times 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 divided by oh so that's the answer so you get 3.34 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms and we know that delta e is equal to delta mc squared so we're going to put 3.34 times 10 to the negative 28 kilo, kilograms times c which is three times, that's the speed of light. And they have, wait, they made a mistake again. It's supposed to be meters per second. Oh boy, they made some mistakes this year. Three times 10 to the eight meters per second. What's going on? So we have three point, let me just do this again, point two zero one four times 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27. So this might be a question they have to scrap because they, they could confuse children who are already sweating in an exam. Times 3 times 10 to the 8 times, times 10 to the 8. And that would give us That will give us 3.0 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. Remember, this will give, well, let me put it, kilograms meter squared over second squared. So 3.0 times 10 to the negative 11 joules. Got this is actually joules.